Hello, everybody, and welcome to another webinar with the Fear Group. I'm your co-host, Adam Russo, and uh, it's gloomy here in Boston. It is just not a nice day. We had an amazing July. The weather was amazing for about six weeks straight, and I can tell you that if I was on vacation this week, I'd be a little upset. I think that we all know that. With me, as always, is our co-host, Brady Bizarro. Say hello, Brady. Hello, Brady. As well as once in a while, he joins us because the... I guess the infamous Ron Peck is unavailable today. Ron had more important things to do today. I think he has a cable guy coming to his house to uh, some cable issues with his access to HBO and Showtime, so he decided that's more important than coming to the webinar. So in his place, I think we have a little bit of an upgrade. <laughs> a little better looking, a little thinner. John Jeblon. Say hello, John. Hello. <laughs> and as always, the one that everyone actually wants to listen to dial in for, I don't know why, but she gets the fans. The infamous, the amazing Jennifer McCormick. Say hello, Jen. Good afternoon. All right. Again, she won't do it. She won't just say hello, Jen. It's annoying. <laughs> but, folks, we have a huge audience today. Thank you very much for the people that have dialed in. As always, we are recording this. It will be available in a few hours on our website. Feel free to send us in your questions. And we promise that we will try to answer the good ones. We'll make fun of the bad ones. And we'll try to do a podcast shortly thereafter if we think that there's any one particular topic that needs additional attention. But today's webinar is about breaking the mold, creative solutions for everyday problems. I call this KISS, keep it simple, stupid. I mean, bottom line is, these are issues that every single one of you, whether you're, you're a third party administrator, you're a broker, you're an ASO, you're a carrier, if you're at all involved in the self-funded business, these are things that you're seeing. And what we're telling you is there are pretty simple solutions to it in most cases. Because what happens is that many times the simple solutions become complex problems because you're not resolving them right when you have the opportunity to do so. So you'll see the slide here, the good looking folks. Folks, just so you know, nobody here other than myself looks as good as they do in those photos. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen Brady look that. I mean, look at Brady. That's not even him. He's miserable. <laughs> totally. I mean, it's, it's not Brady. And John, what he's doing to his jacket is he's uh, tucking it. I don't know. It's, don't and, and Jen, that's the best day of her life, it <laughs> seems to me. <laughs> Anyways, please don't make fun of me. Don't put me down. Make sure that you follow us on LinkedIn. Folks, we're getting almost, we're almost at 3,000. So for those you who don't know, Matt Painton, on the next one, uh, Matt Painton is our client account manager. He was supposed to get us at 3,000 followers on LinkedIn, I think, over the winter time. It is now August. We're in the middle of an August heat wave, and we still do not have 3,000 followers. And somehow he got a promotion. How'd that happen? <laughs> Very interesting how we still got a promotion. I'm not sure. Folks, don't forget, our people here are being FIA certified. Interestingly enough, Jen McCormick just sent me the questions for FIA certification level two, and I have yet to read them. I'm hoping that I get 100% on the exam. I think, how many questions are there, Jen? There's going to be 50 questions. 50 questions total. You have to get a what on the exam to pass certification? 75%. All right. So clearly I'll pass. Brady will have an easy time passing. Maybe John might not. We'll see. <laughs> it, it depends. But we're really excited about it here. So far, I think about 50% of our people have passed via certification level one, and they have until the end of the year to pass it. So hopefully they do so they don't lose their jobs. And while we're speaking of jobs, a special shout out to Holly Peters of BPA Best Life Benefit Plan Administrators. She's one of the few people that actually listen to our webinars. She actually watches our vlogs. She listens to our podcasts. So we really appreciate that, and we will make sure that Matt sends you something. I don't know, Matt, what do we have? Do we have things left to give away? I'm assuming we do. We have plenty. Matt's saying we have plenty. So hopefully you know, we'll give you, we will send you a nice gift package uh, for being one of our FIA fanatics. So we appreciate uh, you listening to us. And speaking of... As you all know, I want to make sure we congratulate Matt. Again, this is the last time we will have this slide. I promise. Matt, as you know, has been promoted to the air traffic controller here at FIA. He is a client account manager now, in addition to all the fun social media stuff that he does. Feel free to email Matt how you feel, what you think, at cam at feedgroup.com. Folks, just so you know, I do get those emails to my inbox, so please do not. <laughs> when you're trying to make Matt feel better about his job, saying, oh, Adam's not a nice guy, blah, blah. I get those emails, too, for full disclosure. Now, before we get to the next slide, we're doing something different here today, so I want everyone to be aware of this. We're asking for your feedback. So when I say ask your feedback, we're asking you to email us at cam at or 
send us in a uh, comment in the comment box. We have a short animation. Now, what is the animation? Really quick story. So we hired, you know, I think about seven interns over the summer, and one of our interns came up to me and, uh, and said that he was an, he's an expert animator, and I did not know what that meant. I have no idea what that meant. But he actually, on his own, just did an animation of Fia, an intro of what Fia does, who Fia is, etc. And I was just really impressed with it. Then the, 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 the college student or the intern made a mistake. He actually told me it took him like an hour to do. He should have told me it took him a week because I would have believed it. But we liked it so much that we felt, you know what, let's see if this kid can do this and maybe something we can put on our website, something that we can share with the industry, something that we can utilize to uh, identify new employees, retain new employees, send it to clients. And if this works, we're thinking about using it for demos, like for our um, a PDM software, a plan document management software, just ways that we can actually share with people, with brokers, with potential clients, what we do here at FIA. So we want to share this with you. I promise you won't take that long. And we'd love to see, get your feedback on it uh, either today during the webinar or even afterwards by emailing us at cam, C-A-M, at fiagroup.com. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to get this animation going. Matt? Oh, we got some technical difficulties here. We apologize. We're almost there. Welcome to the FIA Group. We are an experienced provider of healthcare cost containment techniques. We offer comprehensive consulting services, legal analysis, plan document drafting, subrogation and overpayment recovery, claim negotiation, and plan defense. These services are designed to control costs and protect plan assets. We see a big problem for many businesses here in the United States. Employers want to offer top-notch and robust health benefit plans to their employees and their families. But employers are also faced with the high cost of health care that continues to increase. As a result, the cost of offering health benefits to employees and their families is too expensive. This leaves employers with a tough decision to make. The employer can either downgrade the benefits or offset the cost onto their employees through higher copays and deductibles, neither of which is a great option. That is where we step in. We try to make health benefits affordable for both the employer and the employee, because hardworking Americans deserve access to high quality and affordable health care. Our unique approach is to empower plans. That means we help employers maximize benefits, minimize costs, and take control of their own health plans. The way we empower plans is by promoting and educating employers about self-funding. We also invent and implement cost containment services while delivering custom solutions to meet specific needs. Together, we can help both employers and employees save money on health care. So, that's done. It didn't take that long. I think, Jen, who, who actually was the audio on that? Is that Erin? That is Erin. One of our attorneys here at FIA, Erin Hussey, is that her name? So, she did the audio. I think the first take she did wasn't that, I, I think she didn't have enough uh, passion. I think this one's a little bit more passionate, but we'd love your feedback because we're thinking about utilizing this, obviously, on our website, et cetera, and for other things as well. So please let us know. So let's get back to it. We're talking about creative solutions for everyday problems. So what is the overview? We're going to talk about the political update. That's why and the only reason why Brady is here. <laughs> I still don't think if Brady actually knows what we do here at FIAR. I really don't. I, 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 yet, I still don't believe it. We did a podcast yesterday. The podcast was 11 minutes long. Brady mentioned that he lived in D.C. five times during the podcast. Okay, we're also going to talk about PGCs, frequently asked questions. That is why Jed is here. We're going to talk about networks, RAFs, claim determinations. That claim determination is a big thing. We're seeing more and more potential stop loss issues for good and bad reasons. We're going to talk about that. Objective consultation, we're going to talk about that. What, why do I, what do I mean by that? You need to be objective. If you have the same people making the second level appeal reviews as the first level appeal and the initial claim, it's a potential problem. And last but not least, we're going to talk about antiquated SPDs. Unlike antique cars, antiquated SPDs are not valuable. They actually have no value. So with that, really quick, if you haven't noticed, look at the middle here. Everyone likes the video. Can someone send me something bad about the video? That'd be great. We'd like some bad – we'd like some um, – I guess, uh, criticism, right? We want some constructive sure. criticism. But if you look at the middle, it says hardworking Americans deserve access to high-quality affordable health care. 
folks, just so you know, the intern that did our, the intern that did our actual video, the animation, the only piece of material he had on FIA was this paper, this piece of paper. This one slide is all he knew about FIA. He was able to do an animation based on this. That's it. Um, so I think this is very telling that a 22, I'm sorry, a 20 year old college kid at Seton Hall University in New Jersey was able to do an animated video using just this slide, which tells you a lot of, I think, well, of what it is we're trying to do, which is lower the overall cost of care. With that being said, we're going to turn it over to Jen McCormick. Jen, please talk about what the month of July's most frequently asked questions were and how we can help our clients deal with those particular issues. All right, great. And then one technical thing I want to address shortly, too, is that if you're having a hard time hearing us, please make sure that you're dialing in using the phone number on the webinar, and that can guarantee a higher quality of video. All right, let's dig right in. So number one, what is the difference between ADA leave and short-term disability slash long-term disability leave? So we have been talking about the difference for ADA leave and why continuation of coverage versus a leave of absence are completely separate concepts. So when we're talking about ADA leave specifically, this is something that is granted for an individual as a reasonable accommodation. So this was in light that people started adding this sort of provision to their plan because of a particular UPS case, UPS case where there was a individual who was pregnant who was unable to continue delivering packages for UPS. And there was not necessarily another function that she could perform. And the reasonable accommodation for her in that context was a leave. So a reasonable accommodation or ADA leave is separate from a short-term disability or a long-term disability in the sense that the leave under ADA is an accommodation as opposed to a designated leave. So if this is something that you are wishing to comply with ADA and want to make sure that your plan documents, employee handbooks, and staff loss carrier are all on the same page, it's going to be an important time now as we're nearing the end of the year. Look at your plans and make sure that you are addressing all of these types of leaves and you understand that an ADA leave is for an accommodation, not necessarily something that's otherwise granted through short-term or long-term disability policy. Uh, next. What are the rules for creating a distinct legal entity between a plan and a company? So before we dig into this one. Jen, real quick on this. Yep. Is this the question tying to the fact that the plan and the actual company are two separate That's right. entities, correct? That's right. Two different tax ID numbers? Right. So this is not necessarily a requirement, but this is something that we're always recommending for that particular reason. These are separate entities that are performing separate functions. The plan the plan administrator, the plan sponsor, is separate from the employer. So if this is something that interests you in creating a separate or a distinct legal entity for the plan, those are things you'll need to do, like get a separate tax ID number. Maybe this is something where you want to have a separate trust account in place. Maybe this is something that you're interested in doing so that you can be ensured that there's not necessarily a commingling of funds. As we know, some of these 5,500 rules are going to be released and actually effective shortly. So that's going to put a lot of burdens and administrative processes on employers and plans to make sure they're abiding with these rules. So maybe this is something to proactively consider by having this in place so there's less worry when it comes time to actually implementing those 5,500 rules for filing those forms. Hey, when it comes back to, I want to get back to this for a second. So is it possible, and again, I'm just trying to keep it simple, right? If a claim comes in, and we're a self-funded plan, if a claim comes in for one of our employees, let's say it's Brady, right? Uh, wrong, I probably wouldn't want to pay claims for Brady. I'm sorry, let's say John, okay? John's a hard worker, good man. But John has a claim that's not covered under the plan. It would be considered experimental investigation, let's say. I, as the company, can decide to pay that claim, right, outside of the terms of the plan. Is that's that right. correct? That's right. So there's a separate thing between a plan asset and an employer asset, and we talk about this all of the time. Uh, and you know, this is one of the concepts and theories that we've actually used for some of our programs here at FIA. So an employer does have the right to say, I want to, play, to pay these claims outside of the plan. But the concern potentially is that maybe there could be a cause if that was acted or being handled in a discriminatory fashion. So as with anything else, just make sure that if there is a claim that is being paid outside of the term, that it's being done in a neutral fashion, and you're not discriminating against anybody, and it's being properly taxed. 
All right, and last but not least, can a health plan exclude all autism related benefits? Are there compliance concerns with this? So this is a loaded question. Now, real quick on this one, because I know, John, I mean, you've been saying so much already on this one. It's amazing. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not, we're not, we're not Ron at all. Um, Want to ask, do you say all autism? Is the answer you're going to give related to other types of disorders as well, or just autism? Because I'm assuming we'll get a question on how about all some other disease, some chronic illness or something. So right. is it just, are you going to, is your answer just tied to autism or is it other I'm conditions? I'm going to talk about it all. Wow. So. Thank you, Jen. Before you do real quick though, Jen, <laughs> yeah. I think the reason this question is being asked is I heard on the radio a few weeks ago that the number of babies being born with autism is really, really high, especially for boys. It's like one in six now. So these claims are, there's so many more, many more of them lately. I think that's why this question is being asked. Want to put that yeah, out there. people are interested about it. This is actually something that's being advocated by a lot of different physician groups and a lot of different associations out there. So the other thing with autism is right now, there's no federal law that mandates the, covered, the coverage of autism related benefits. Also, the thing with autism is that autism is a medical condition. It is not a benefit. So when we're talking about autism-related benefits here, we're actually thinking of the broader context of maybe applied behavioral analysis or some other types of therapy, a speech therapy or occupational therapy, not necessarily autism, the medical condition itself. So there are a lot of other laws that kind of need to come into play. So the, the short answer to this question is there's nothing necessarily right now that says that you cannot exclude autism-related benefits like ABA and plan. But with that caveat, there are some other conditions that you should consider. Most important is the mental health parity rule. So right now, there's not anything on point and under the mental health parity regulations that specifically say that autism is considered a mental health service or mental health condition. That might change. People are advocating for that. The other thing to consider is ACA. So under ACA, we know that an employer is not allowed, if they select a benchmark, to put any sort of dollar limitations on benefits. So if ABA therapy or certain services are considered to be essential within a particular state's benchmark, then we know that the plan could not imply a dollar limitation, but they could potentially impose a frequency or a visit limitation. But the potential concern there is if they do that, is that creating a distinction between a health benefit and a mental health benefit where they're not acting in parity? So there's a lot of potential concerns, and before you actually implement an exclusion or carve out for ABA or autism, I would caution you to take a look at the actual plan participants and the pushback that this might create from a compliance perspective, mental health parity, ACA, and your employees. Great. So now we're going to turn it over to Brady to talk about healthcare. I guess topping the polls, huh, Brady? They were are. Were you in recently? Let's tell me, uh, tell us all about it. In my mind, I was. I'm glad I was able to pause C-SPAN momentarily to come do this webinar. <laughs> but there's a lot going on. Um, I like this graphic from Kaiser Health News. But they're, the midterms are the big story right now, right? They're coming up soon. Um, the Democrats are basically running on saying, look, we're trying to save the Affordable Care Act. It's really been in a state of flux. We know what happened at the end of last year. A lot of Republicans are looking to put the final nail in the coffin, I think, in the fall. But the problem that we're seeing now, and I think going forward, is that on the other side of the aisle, Democrats don't know what they're about in terms of policy. You have the progressive wings who want, who want Medicare for all. You have some Democrats from the old guard who want to just sort of keep the ACA in place and protect it, and they can't figure out what they want. So that leaves the rest of us sort of guessing to see what's going to happen in the fall. But in the meantime, there are a number of lawsuits that we mentioned um, in the previous webinars and podcasts that are all about the ACA. Some groups are suing the administration saying that, you know, the fact that they're sabotaging the law, that that's illegal under the Constitution because the executive has the duty to uphold and execute the laws. On the other side, you have lawsuits that are attacking the ACA saying that now that the individual mandate's been repealed, the rest of the law has to go because that was the foundation of the law. Those are working their way through the courts as one that was filed in Texas District Court uh, and federal court there. We're watching those. And so if there are updates to bring on those, we'll bring them to you um, as they happen. But in the meantime, a few other regulations and rules have been issued. We talked about association health plans. And today I just wanted to mention one about short-term health plans. And recently, um, what has changed with those regulations? Last week, the administration announced new rules on short-term plans. Now, these are plans for people in the individual market, but I'll talk about why we should be concerned briefly um, in a little bit. But just quickly, what they did here is they extended the duration of short-term plans. Um, it was 
three months, that was something that actually was changed under, at the end of the Obama administration. They, they changed the duration of short-term plans from 12 months to three months. Now they've been extended far beyond that to as much as 36 months or essentially three years. And that's a big deal because these are plans that are not required to comply with the ACA's requirements about pre-existing conditions, about essential health benefits. Um, so you can be denied coverage based on your medical history, and you can have things like prescription drugs not covered, mental uh, mental health laws not being followed, and maternity coverage. It's it's really their skimpy plans. Have you seen one of these plans already? Have you seen one of these so-called junk insurance plans? I've I've seen yeah I've seen I've seen some. They don't cover anything. I mean they're they're just literally they're just a shell of insurance. They're, they're not. They have not been. Uh, proliferating lately, but I think now that you can sell them for up to 36 months, they're going to be more popular, and we're going to see a lot more. Of them. People will know what is covered, right, by them. So yeah, when you're paying five dollars a month for your premium, I'm assuming you know you're probably not getting much coverage. Yeah, that's right. you, yeah. and so if you ask the question why why are, why are they doing this? Why are they extending the duration? It's because there is a subset of the population that. Um, doesn't get coverage through their employer. You know, we know about 160 million Americans do, but many don't. Um, they make too much money to qualify for Obamacare subsidies, and they're stuck in the middle. And the ones that are healthy are saying, hmm, we want a cheaper option. This gives them that option. doesn't really cover much, but they have some kind of coverage. And the argument for the administration is saying, look, we're, we're providing a service to those people. Of course, would, you, would you say, and I'm just asking this question, just you know, to see if we can have a discussion on it, catastrophic care only insurance would you consider that junk insurance for example I, you know i'm looking at john again i mean he has a set of word in about it's now 25 minutes okay so i don't know why we even put his picture on the webinar yeah, anyway so great. I don't have anything to add. Not, the point i'm trying to make is if i was john and i go you know what i'm healthy i just want to have insurance in case something knock on wood really bad happens would that be considered junk you're not covering any you know, preventive health care claims, you're not covering your, your, your flu shots, you're not covering your, you know, your urgent care stuff even, or you're, you know, you're getting stitches. Is that junk? I, I don't like the term junk because it's a Well, you put it on there. I did. Well, it's a political <laughs> term. I, you put the word <laughs> junk on the spot. I think it's it's based on, you know, what John wants. Obviously, he doesn't need maternity well, coverage. what John wants. He, right. Then I would say for him, it's not junk. But for people, the, the problem it's, it's, is... It does not comply with... Correct. The ACA. Right. So if he has, but you, you could know, buy that right now. You could buy it right now, and it's it's only going to cover you. you know, it's going to be good for you if you're young and healthy, like John. But the reason people are calling it junk is because they're seeing what the impact it's going to have on the individual market, and the impact it will also have, although less, to a lesser degree, on the employer-sponsored market. So just for the same reason, we should be concerned about the individual mandate being repealed. We should be watching what's going on with these short-term plans because it's going to draw young, healthy lives away. So I may say, hey, I've had enough with the FIA plan. I'm going to go get a short-term plan, and I'll be on this plan. And if enough healthy people do that, that's going to impact employer-sponsored insurance too. So we'll we'll see. The predictions are that about 200,000 people could migrate from right now the oh, individual is. exchanges just well, by the end of this year. That's actually a good amount, I think, in a couple months. But if these plans really catch fire and states are already trying to push back and and try to regulate them, but I think this could draw the kinds of lives out of risk pools that really we need for us. I think we plan. offer. Brady, one of these plans. Yeah, well, CCC. I mean, the problem with these types of plans, in addition to drawing away the young, healthy lives to balance that risk, is that isn't this creating or perpetuating a problem where people aren't going to get the care that they need because they, they can't afford it? So for those preventive services that were covered at 100%, if you needed a flu shot, you're not going to get it, and you're going to wait until a claim is a million-dollar claim as opposed to a $10 flu shot? So wait, so Jenna, are you saying that government actions aren't addressing the cost of care? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Is that, that's the theme that we've been talking about for months um, in the political update, and that's not changing now. But there are two quick things I want to mention before I move to the next slide um, that are not on the slide, they're, but they're important enough to mention. One is the HSA expansion bill that passed the House of Representatives. So there's been a number of committee hearings in the last few months about how to expand HSAs. They're very popular. Uh, these are proposals that would effectively increase how and when a person can contribute. One of the pieces that was added or amendments added to this bill, um, it would modify the treatment of direct primary care service so that arrangements like those are not considered impermissible other coverage, which previously have been disqualifying you from using your HSA. So that's a big deal for direct primary care. Uh, there's a lot of buzz on LinkedIn about it and the industry about it. And I think as we go forward, um, if that passes the Senate, right now this bill is in the Senate, but that's a popular provision on both sides of the aisle, and I think it's a good chance it could get signed into law in some fashion. Maybe not by the end of this year, but certainly probably early next but, year. But the fact that people can use their money 
Correct. To pay for direct primary care on a PEPM basis would be awesome. I mean, that would be, right. would, Jen, what would you say our percentage of all the plans that we write that are HSA plans? I mean, give me a guess. Uh, about a quarter to so a third. 25 to 30 percent of all the plans we write are HSA plans. And these folks right now could not use that HSA money to pay for a direct primary care right. provider. Which if, is, if you cannot implement that type of program right now and use those funds. You have to come up with some other creative way, whether it's a per service or right. figuring yeah. out a menu. And one last very quick plug, which would be for C-SPAN on September 4th, <laughs> the hearings are going to start for Justice, or soon to be Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, he's an important potential member of the Supreme Court. He could be the swing vote in what ultimately <laughs> decides the fate of Obamacare. So folks, I just want everyone to know, it's not a coincidence that Brady is the only single person here. <laughs> everyone else has someone that actually wants to listen to them talk. There's plenty of girls out there who love I to really doubt this. If you are a woman that is interested in any of these types of discussions, please also text us on the text line there, comment box, because I just don't believe it. I mean, you hear what he just said, September 4th, there is going to be on C-SPAN. Brady, you got one to yourself. Oh, come on. You're going to watch him. Speaking of, someone who just talks way too much, we're finally going to take the muzzle off him. <laughs> we're going to talk about problems. So what are the simple, simple issues? Now, to give you an example. Every single day, every conference we go to, someone says, network, network contracts are a ripoff. I'm paying too much. I'm getting these ridiculous discounts that mean nothing. How many times have we heard somebody say, Oh, it's discount off of what? Your 50% discount off of some fake number. We all hear it. So, John, let's talk about some solutions. But before you do that, before you actually open your mouth, come on. I have one more thing to say. Just want to talk. We recently had a case that we're working on still, and I know Brady's highly involved in it, so am I, where a facility was paid based on a reference based price or pay, paid on some other alternative to a discount. And now the facility is coming back saying that they were not paid pursuant to their network contract. I want everyone on this call to understand. If you get those letters, it is on the provider to prove that they are due a payment based on a network discount. They have to show you or give you some reference to a contract that says that you have breached it. So too often times when our clients get those letters, the first thing they do is panic and start searching for their own contract, trying to make it prove that either A, there is a contract in place, or B, there isn't one. The onus is on the facility to show that either a person came in with that logo on their ID card, or they have a copy of a contract to prove that you pay them based on a reference-based price or some other way, that that was in violation of some separate agreement. Now, with that, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to John Oshubi. Let's do it. John? I'm not sure if I should start talking because Adam will probably interrupt me uh, right away, but um, Adam mentioned in the beginning when we were talking about the, uh, the content of today's webinar, the, uh, the KISS method, the, the keep it simple, stupid method. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about from here on in, you may see the solutions and think that they're simple. You may see the solutions and uh, think that they're somewhat less than simple. I mean, the truth is the ideas are simple, but sometimes the implementation of those ideas is going to depend on a lot of factors and not be quite so simple. So anything that we are about to talk about, please feel free to reach out to us. We've got lots more information than what we are about to impart, so just know that. And with that, I will begin the kissing. Uh, when we're talking about network contracts, as Adam mentioned, um, we get questions constantly. Every conference, every email, I mean, it really seems like this is all I deal with all day. Questions about network contracts and what you can do about them and alternatives to them and why they say what they say. And a lot of the answers are somewhat nonsensical because a lot of the contracts are somewhat nonsensical. So, slide please, Brady. Thank you. So, uh, a couple of potential solutions. You have all by now probably heard of reference-based pricing or some variation thereof. Terminating your network contracts. I mean, the, the, the most basic answer to what can we do about our contracts, get rid of them. Tear them up. Obviously, you shouldn't do that without notifying someone that you're tearing them up just because that won't mean much. But if you terminate those contracts, you're not left high and dry. There are lots of vendors out in the industry who can help you achieve whatever your payment goals may be. If that goal is to pay as little as possible, which it probably is, there are vendors who can help with that. Now, it's worth mentioning that uh, every reference-based pricing vendor has a different style, different techniques, lots of nuances, so we recommend vetting everybody, looking at every possible solution before you just decide on one based on a sales pitch. But you know, it, it, 
whatever you need, you know, if you need contracts reviewed. If you still think that plan defense and patient defense are the same thing, you probably need to reach out to us so we can explain to you the different types of reference-based pricing that exist in the market. Also, make sure you review those contracts in detail because many times there are claim value requirements before any type of defense actually kicks in. Yeah, minimum so, threshold. Right. So if you, there is no, if you have a $300 balance bill, trust me, no one is going to the Supreme Court to defend that case. So the value thresholds are a key. John? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, along with reference-based pricing, there are types of partial reference-based pricing. One is regarding certain services, which we commonly call uh, a carve-out. And some very popular ones are dialysis and air ambulance is starting to uh, – become more popular in the industry. Essentially, any services that are consistent nuisances and high dollar claims are uh, candidates to carve out. And, and frankly, just about anything, obviously there are ACA concerns and whatnot, and our consulting team will be happy to help with any questions you have. But if you are seeing claims that you can carve out of your plan, chances are there is some way to address it. Right, and in regards to the dialysis, the big pushback that we see is people do not do the actual carve out correctly. So we see a lot of litigation on that front. But on the air ambulance, if you can mention, if you guys mention it at all, aren't there some states that have laws related to how much air ambulance providers actually receive? So uh, there's the federal, uh, the Airline Deregulation Act. Sorry for putting you on the spot. No, there, no, not at all. So that, that's trying to make you look smart there. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. It's going to take a lot more than that. Okay. But the Airline Deregulation Act is a, uh, a federal law that a lot of air ambulance companies try to hide behind to basically say, this federal law says that states are not allowed to determine what we can charge and receive. Ha ha, we win. And the answer to that is that's actually kind of a good thing for payers because if states are not allowed to make laws that regulate what air ambulance providers have to charge or be paid, then payers can kind of do their own thing and payers can carve out services. Whereas if states were going to make laws that say you must pay X, payers wouldn't have that freedom. So it's kind of funny because the very law that the air ambulance companies try to hide behind is the same one that essentially helps payers be able to use things like carve outs. And um, uh, last thing on uh, reference-based pricing, it's worth mentioning that it is possible, um, and you may have heard us discuss this in the past, but it is possible to uh, carve out all out-of-network claims. So not just dialysis, not just air ambulance, but anything not falling within the primary PPO. So you can keep your PPO and still have a solution on the back end. And that's where we come into uh, the problem with RAT network contracts. And the issue here, uh, like a primary network, but much, much worse. <laughs> and of course, we mean all the offense in the world to uh, folks who operate the RAT networks, but that's, that's the name of the game, right? Well, don't forget, guys. I mean, you know, when I, we talk about RAP networks, one of the issues that we people say is, you know, well, the discount on is good. And on many of these claims, it would be almost a nuisance for you to try to negotiate, right? So a lot of times a RAP network could be utilized. I can see why some would want one in place because you got a $300 claim, a $500 claim, a $1,000 claim. You may not want to negotiate every single one of those. You may not want to deal with balanced billing on an out of network. So that's why people are attracted to RAPs in the first place. However, I think it's really hard to make an argument to utilize a RAP when you have a $100,000 claim or a $50,000 claim where you can – and those claims don't come up that often, right? I mean, the average claim that we see out there is a couple grand. Yeah. The average claim is not 50000 or 100000 Those are outlier claims, hospital claims, you know, big, you know, specialty drug claims. The reality is if you wanted to pick and choose those small claims and negotiate them, those big claims and negotiate them on the side, you can still keep that wrap network in place if you wanted to. But, John, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, there are – a lot of claims that, as Adam said, it's not really worth engaging in individual negotiation. I mean, that's especially true when a TPA or health plan negotiates in-house, right? Because when you're paying a vendor, it's a percentage of savings, and if nothing gets done, then nothing gets paid. Fantastic. But if you're doing it in-house, you're, you're using those resources no matter what. So if you're engaging in individual negotiation, there's no question that that will take more time than just processing through a RAP network. RAP networks are easy. That's their sell. They are very, very easy. And sure, there are discounts, but they're usually not very good. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the options here, you can, of course, get rid of your RAP network. You can always cancel a contract, just like with the primary PPO. Right, and we have that through FIA Unwrapped. FIA Unwrapped, absolutely, and I'll talk about that in, in just a second. But it's also worth mentioning that if you keep your RAP network, which, as Adam said, it does make sense to keep the RAP network for a lot of the smaller claims. 
if you keep your rap network, it is possible to take big claims and say, you know what, actually, we do want to negotiate this individually. We don't want this to flow through the RAP network because it's a 10% a discount on a $200,000 claim. But for a $200 claim, sure, whatever, we'll put it through the RAP. We'll take a 10% discount on that. It doesn't matter. But for $200,000, it sure does matter. So if they get anything out of this slide, the point is that they can pull claims out of the RAP Instead of going and being paid through a rep network, they can actually choose to identify, identify the claims, set a dollar threshold, and, and take those claims and negotiate those claims themselves or through a vendor, correct? Right, and unlike a primary PPO network. Well, you could not do that. Absolutely, right. I so, want to make sure we repeat that. <laughs> we are not telling that you, we're not telling you that our primary network, you can pull claims over a certain dollar out and negotiate them because you know someone's going to call up and say, hey, we heard that. See, I said that on the webinar. No, we didn't. Right, John? Right, absolutely. <laughs> now, that's not to say that trying to negotiate high dollar in network claims is impossible. It's, it, it can be possible. All right, let's not go there, John. <laughs> let's don't go there. Don't make it a systematic thing. And if there's pushback, you should give up. Got it. <laughs> uh, that's the disclaimer. But uh, for um, in lieu of wrapped networks, we actually here at FIA, we offer a service called FIA Unwrapped. It's not mentioned by name on this slide, but where it says RBP for OON, sorry about all those acronyms, but that's what we're talking about, reference-based pricing for out-of-network claims. And it's, it's designed as exactly as it sounds. It's that if a claim does not fall within the primary PPO, you can use reference-based pricing for right. it. Right, and your people, your employees and their, and their dependents, they have loyalty to that primary network. They have loyalty to their provider, their, their doctor, but they don't have loyalty to a random doctor in Peoria when they happen to have a you know fall somewhere and have to go to the local emergency room, they don't have any loyalty to right. that particular facility. Right. That's why it makes sense. Yeah. And uh, so, in the interest of time here, I just like to mention direct primary care on this slide. I know Brady talked about it a bit, but it's it's very relevant if you're looking to play around with your RAP network because direct primary care can be very beneficial if there are uh, no primary care providers in a given space. So, for instance, we at FIA, we've got employees all over the country at this point. We do use a, a robust network, but if we did not, if we decided to do something like a narrow network or a localized network, we could hire some direct primary care doctor out in, say, Cleveland, where Kelly Dempsey works, and Kelly could visit the primary care. Magic. Exactly. <laughs> like, but the bottom line is, you know, many facilities, a lot of people say, oh, isn't that an on-site clinic? On-site clinic makes sense for large companies where they actually have an on-site clinic, a nurse or a doctor in their building. Clearly, we're not that big yet, right? But we have a local doctor four miles away, Dr. Tremblay, who is our direct primary care. Anyone here at FIA can utilize him. We pay a flat rate every month, whether you go to him or not. And that makes a lot of sense. Like you said, if you had a pure RBP plan, you could still have a direct primary care or doctor who then can refer you and be the gatekeeper regarding claims. It helps, especially on narrow network. So obviously, folks, think about this. The narrower the primary network, the more out of network there is. Right. So what we're noticing now is more and more employers and more and more TPAs having narrow networks where instead of 5 7% of their claims are being out of network, it's 20 to 30% of their claims are out of network because of those small number of providers that are actually in the network. So great options here, great opportunity here. And let's turn it over back to Jen. All right. She's going to talk about some medical claim determinations. And this, I think, is where we see the biggest Achilles heel in the industry overall, just the wrong people making the wrong decisions. Right, so the threshold issue here to consider is that as a plan administrator, you are a fiduciary. And under ERISA, there are certain requirements that ERISA imposes as far as your obligations to prudently manage the assets of the plan. So with this obligation, with this responsibility, with the threat of potential ERISA claims, ERISA litigation, when you see a potentially complex, problematic medical claim, you're not sure how to handle it. Maybe it's something that TPA has never happened before, or has never seen before. Maybe that's a situation that you're not necessarily in the best position or best suited to address. So as a kind of a quick example, this is a case study that we all love to talk about at least, is surrogacy. So imagine a situation where there is a plan that Are has- Are really talking about surrogacy again? Just imagine a situation. The plan has an exclusion for surrogacy. It's a vague exclusion, and it just says surrogacy. It doesn't say specifically what that entails. And the plan, looking at that, they didn't confer with anyone. They didn't talk to the TPA. They decided that 
in their minds, that meant that anything that was related to surrogacy, whether it's the labor, whether it's the delivery, whether it's the preventive services, are all excluded under that particular exclusion. So the plan denies it, the patient and their attorney appeal it, and guess what, in that appeal, that attorney is citing a violation of ACA, a violation of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, a violation of Section 1557. That puts a big problem for the plan administrator who wasn't well suited to make that decision in the first place. So when it comes to having those types of situations, I know surrogacy is one that we've talked about a ton, but it's actually representative of a situation where maybe the plan administrator is not necessarily best suited to address those types of situations on their own. Because remember, as a plan administrator, a plan sponsor, you have a fiduciary duty to prudently manage the assets of the plan. And if you are not best situated to handle a situation or address it, maybe you're not a clinician, maybe you need some other medical review, you should seek the guidance of somebody else, someone who's actually objective, someone who can provide you with guidance on the potential implications and the considerations of having that type of exclusion and potentially excluding it under the plan. What Jen is basically saying is to call FIA, but she doesn't want to just say that, right, Jen? Is that what's happening here? <laughs> find an expert. Find someone that knows this stuff. Find someone that knows everything about ERISA. She wants you to call her, folks. Okay, good, good to know. So, yeah, and one of the ways that you can mitigate that risk, because remember, there's a lot of people who maybe are interested in self-funding. They previously had been fully insured, but they're not necessarily sure how to go about it, or maybe they're scared. Or maybe they're scared about a particular situation where it's a smaller company, and then if the employer realizes they deny a claim for John, that John's going to go talk about it and tell everybody, and they don't want to be in that position. So maybe they want to consider transferring that fiduciary risk, that responsibility, to somebody else. And that's through our PACE product. So just a quick understanding. One of the biggest reasons why employers are afraid to go from fully insured to self-funded whether it's in the ASO or the TPA environment, is because of that fiduciary risk, right? They're, they're worried now for the first time they have to make these claim decisions. What you're telling people is you don't have to have all those decisions. Right. Those tough ones, you put in the hands of a third party that can help you with that, right? Right, and that is something that you're allowed to do to delegate that responsibility away under ERISA. And based on that, it goes right into our next question, which is how we get good advice. Because one of the things that we've seen here, and folks, people always ask me, you know, what made you start FIA? What made you found this organization? One of the things that I found, even at a young age, at the age of 25, right? I mean, I'm better looking now than I was then, but let's just say that. I wasn't as smart then as I am now, I think. But one of the things I noticed that in our industry, in the self-funding world, there aren't that many people that really get it. There aren't that many attorneys out there. It isn't like we can just pick up the phone and call some law firm who will give us all the information we need on our self-funded ERISA plan. It just doesn't exist. If I wanted to find a personal injury lawyer, I can go to any billboard. If I want to find a state attorney, really easy to do. But to identify someone that understands this business and understands how stop loss and networks and facilities and direct contracting and, uh, and uh, prescription drugs, how it all fits, is not easy to do. It's not easy to find good advice. So take that issue away, Jen. Yeah, so when we're dealing with this too, and also when you're looking for the solution of, I have a really difficult problem, I'm looking for an objective review, it's potentially really expensive for a law firm to look into this for me or for another entity to look into this for me. One of the ways that we can help or that someone should be able to help you is not necessarily specific to providing that compliance answer, but looking at it from a other perspective. So what is the business strategy? What is the potential considerations or implications for the employer? Outside of that, are there opportunities for me to conserve or to save costs? So when you're looking at a complex situation, it's important that you're looking at it not solely with that tunnel vision, looking at compliance alone. It needs to be a much broader scope than that. So let me give you an example. Um, and I apologize for jumping in here, but this, this really gets on my nerve oftentimes, where we'll talk to a plan or an administrator, and they'll say, yeah, well, we don't really have any legal issues. And I know for a fact that they, have had not, they haven't had anyone look at the stop loss policies that their brokers are putting on their plan, client plans. They have not had anyone review any of their vendor agreements. They have had a single person look at their PBM contracts or their pharmacy claims, or they haven't had anyone look at their network agreements. Nothing. They haven't had anyone look at their SPDs to make sure they're not antiquated, which we're gonna talk about later on. So people often say, oh, we only spent $5,000 on legal fees. Folks, one, Wrong claim decision is going to cost you $50,000. One plan, Dr. Tillegal, is going to cost you a client. 
one plan that doesn't get reimbursed by a stop loss carrier is going to cost you that business the following year in a broker that will never work with you again. Not to mention liability if somebody decides to point the finger at you. Well, John's still here. Amazing. Still here. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is people often look at this and go, we only spent $8,000 over the past two years in our budget on legal issues. The whole point is this is these are things that you should be doing to avoid any legal need. These are things you're putting in place proactively to make sure that you're not getting sued down the road. And there are, is a robust list. Feel free, folks, anybody. We can send over to you a list of all the things that you should be looking at every single year, whether with the, with the paralegal, with us, with the law firm, with somebody, that every single year you should be looking at these things, including your ASA, to make sure that you're not only in compliance, but you're following best business practices. Right, no, exactly. So just because you're looking to find what is the, what is the compliant answer, what is it appropriate to do, this is a, a, an example that we've seen today. We had a situation where someone realizes that the question that they're answering is not a compliance concern, but they're looking for the best way to implement this. What is the way that I can implement this strategy based on making sure that the employees aren't pushing back, that I'm not receiving that backlash? So I want to make sure that I can implement this in a way that is going to cause the least amount of resistance and the least concern for our employees so we can create and have that goodwill. One of those big issues that we talked about that you should be looking at ahead of time are the soft and hard gaps. The hard gaps are easier when it comes to your stop loss problems. Brady, I want to make sure we're clear. Folks, we are noticing more and more stop loss issues. It's not any particular carrier in question. There are some really good stop loss carriers out there. But it's almost a behavioral pattern that we're noticing, which are soft gaps. Not something that you will see in the policy itself, just behaviorally. We're noticing these things. But, great, if you don't mind just sharing a little bit about the issue and what there, what we could do out there to resolve them. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, it's definitely true that we've, we've seen a lot more disputes lately. I know I've been uh, burning the candle on both ends trying to work on some of them. But <laughs> Really? <what? laughs> like, come, on, see, come on, Brady. Really? You're home at 530, man. What? So one thing important to know is that, look, the, the truth is that both – Stop loss carriers and plans, we're in this fight together, right? They're best friends, but even best friends fight from time to time. And so some of the problems that we've seen lately, like Adam said, have to do with soft gaps, Thing that, things that may not catch your eye immediately if you're reviewing the stop loss policy, say, on your own. If you're looking at the exclusions page, you say, oh, there's only like four exclusions here. They say they mirror the plan document. You may think you're home free. You're good to go. But that's not always the case. And I want to bring up two examples of things we've seen recently um, that I think are, are interesting, are a bit unique. But also a big problem that I think we, we're going to see them more um, as, as disputes arise in the future. Before you start there, John, I want to make sure you get on, in on this. We have seen reasons for denial and reasons for a delay, new reasons that we've never seen before. Over the past year, I mean, we're like, hey, get, get over here. Look at this reason. Like, there's a lot of new stuff now. And that's why it's concerning. Yeah, Sorry, so, Brady, go ahead. so two of those new, you know, new issues that we've seen, one has to do with the treatment of PBM rebates. So who would have thought about that, right? This is one where, and potentially you could have a lot of rebates involved if you had a lot of pharmacy claims, which you probably do have. So here's a scenario we encounter, right? You have a PBM contract that, let's face it, probably wasn't really intensively reviewed. You have a health plan getting, um, or in theory, getting a bunch of rebates from drug manufacturers. But who's keeping those rebates? Not the plan, it's the PBM. Worse still, what happened to this plan in particular was they found that their stop loss carrier, who found out about all these rebates through an audit, was then reducing the reimbursement amount the plan was getting by the amount of that rebate. Even though the Even plan though, wasn't getting the rebate. Yes, absolutely. And so, and it wasn't clear the language in the policy was, you know, we argued at least, it didn't exactly say PBM rebates, but the wording was clever. It, they were relying on interpreting it a certain way, refund, rebate, you know, amount returned to the plan or returned to some entity. Potentially returned exactly. to the plan. And so this was unbelievable to the plan. They said, what do you mean? How can they be reducing our reimbursement? We didn't get these rebates. And there was many tens of, I think even hundreds of thousands of dollars or so that were at stake. And it could be, you know, unlimited and, and you know, potentially depending on how many claims you have in a given year. But these that's a big deal that we've we've seen more of that lately and it's something that you may not think about when you think about typical stop loss problems. Another one quickly is one to do with billing protocols. So that sounds boring, right? Who would have who would have thought you'd see that in an exclusion section? You probably won't. But what we've seen lately is some stop loss policies um, will basically say that they are paying claims or reimbursing claims in accordance with standardized billing protocols. And some even cite the Centers for Medica Medicaid and Medicare, uh -oh. which is interesting. So why would you be citing, why would they be citing those billing protocols when 
CMS is not the payer here, right? This is these aren't Medicare claims. These are private payers. So are they trying to pay based on Medicare, even if it's an in network well, claim? Like, so it's not just the Medicare reimbursement rate here that could be an issue. It's the way Medicare itself pays claims. And so in one particular case, a surgery was done, and well, Medicare would not have paid for this part of the surgery, or would have treated those claims, or would have unbundled them, or something like that. And the plan, of course, has no idea this is happening until the carrier is saying, "Hey, look." We're, we're going to have an audit of this claim. It's a large hospital claim, and now we're not paying 30% of it because Medicare wouldn't have paid. And they're saying, why? Yeah, this is actually a very new phenomenon we're seeing here because traditionally when we think of Medicare as it relates to stop-loss and health plans, uh, or, or self-funded health plans, that is, we think of Medicare rates and a plan pays reference-based pricing where the stop-loss carrier determines its usual and customary amount based on Medicare. But what we're seeing uh, more recently is that Stop-loss carriers are using Medicare coding guidelines, but not Medicare pricing, which creates kind of a, a very weird situation where the plan doesn't really know what's going on, and the plan is kind of, you know, utilizing whatever its own payment methodology may be, but unless it's based on Medicare, there's going to be the, the potential for a big problem. So the bottom line, folks, if you are a broker or an administrator, and you are either pushing, promoting, selling stop-loss policies to plans, or if you're subject to having to deal with a specific stop loss policy, even the one that you did in place, we would encourage you to contact us. Even if you don't have the policy, we probably have a copy of that particular stop loss carrier's policy, the paper, and help you understand what the potential areas, what red flags there are potentially in that uh, document. And if you are a TPA who is not placing the stop loss for a particular plan, you might want some type of disclosure form filled out Stating so the plan is aware of the fact that you won't be sued, you're not going to be brought into a litigation if, for whatever reason, a stop loss carrier decided not to reimburse a particular claim. That it wasn't your fault, you didn't place the business. Right. So, with that, we'll yep. turn it over to Jen to go over those antiquated plan doc issues, which is the last issue that we got before this webinar. All right, so exciting stuff. We're talking about stop loss, we're talking about the problems, but what about those plan docs? That's actually oftentimes a source of problems. Maybe these documents are old, maybe they haven't been restated in a number of years, maybe they're not actually accurately reflecting the intentions of the plan administrator, or maybe they're just completely out of date. So there needs to be a way that you can actually create these documents in a consistent fashion, in a uniform fashion, but still maintain that customization that some of these groups are looking for. So when you're looking for that, one of the ways that you can actually do that is online. So there are lots of different automated options that might be available uh, through a particular portal, for example. So say that you're looking for a particular template, maybe you're new to self-funding, maybe you say, I would like to have all of the best practices that FIA or another would actually recommend that you would implement for me. I don't have the necessary time, I'm not necessarily averse on knowing what all of the best practices would be when it comes to self-funding, when it comes to cost containment to actually implement my plan, can you help me with that? So by using a software or another program, it's actually going to streamline the process. So instead of having to go through that 150-page document and read word for word everything that's added in there, making decisions about whether this should be an exclusion or this should be a benefit, why not work with the actual template that has made a lot of those decisions for you by implementing those best practices? So then your review and the decision making is going to be much easier and customized specifically for you. So you're basically telling people to contact you to purchase PDF, right? Is that what you're trying to say? I'm saying that it's a really great option. But the key thing on this is <laughs> the fact that it updates, right? I mean, just to give you an example, over the past two years, how often have we, have we had to update the, the SPD template because of either state or federal rule changes? Yeah, so the compliance-related standards don't necessarily happen all the time, but we at FIA are coming up with new innovative provisions on a quarterly basis. Right, so we're kind of a new stuff on a quarterly basis, but there is still things that come over the past couple of years that we've had to update based on state and or federal rules, correct? There are particular things that need to be modified and addressed, and one of the things that's beneficial about this is that by having this sort of access that you're having an updated plan document provided and provision provided to you all of the time. So we got a great question in. I have to bring this one up. Because FIA certification level one, I got this question wrong. Am I right? You're I am right. acknowledging, folks, I did not get 100%. I got a 99. Okay? Wow. What is an SPD? Brady. Summary plan description. Summary plan 
description. Oh, Not I said documents. <laughs> I did. I'm embarrassed. As the next chairman of SIA, it's embarrassing. I said document and description. But I'm guaranteeing you 50% of the hundreds of people that are listening to this say the same thing. Anyways, Jess, anything else you want to add on that before we end this? No, so just make sure that even if it's not necessarily a fee that you're using, make sure that you're looking at the document, you're updating it for a compliance perspective, and you're updating it to contain costs. If there's a particular problem, a particular issue, a particular benefit that is creating a lot of problems for you, maybe there's an opportunity to look into that particular benefit and see what solutions you can have to contain those costs. Folks, we appreciate you all dialing in today. Feel free to keep emailing us. Our next webinar will be during football season. September 18th, and at that time, my Cleveland Browns will still be undefeated. We're undefeated <laughs> right now. We haven't lost a game. We haven't played one yet. Well, we had, a, we had one preseason game, which we won. But we will get our first win, I predict, before our next webinar. On behalf of Jen McCormick, Brady Bizarro, John Jabla, and myself, the Adam Russo, thank you very much for empowering your plans as a fee group and being on our webinar. Have a great day.